Part 4. Among the Masters A Meeting with Hida Hida is the unseen guide of the Sufis, and it is he who is believed to be the anonymous guide to Moses in the Quran. This green one is often referred to as the Jew, and he has been equated in legend with such figures as St. George and Elijah. This tale, or report, is characteristic of the supernormal functions attributed to Hida, both in folklore and among the dervish teachers. Once, while standing on the banks of the Oxus River, I saw a man fall in. Another man, in the clothes of a dervish, came running to help him, only to be dragged into the water himself. Suddenly I saw a third man, dressed in a robe of shimmering, luminous green, hurl himself into the river. But as he struck the surface, his form seemed to change. He was no longer a man, but a log. The other two men managed to cling to this, and together they worked it towards the bank. Hardly able to believe what I was seeing, I followed at a distance, using the bushes that grew there as cover. The men drew themselves panting on the bank. The log floated away. I watched it until, out of sight of the others, it drifted to the side, and the green-robed man, soaked and sodden, dragged himself ashore. The water began to stream from him. Before I reached him, he was almost dry. I threw myself on the ground in front of him, crying, You must be the present Skidder, the green one, master of the saints. Bless me, for I would attain. I was afraid to touch his robe, because it seemed to be of green fire. He said, You have seen too much. Understand that I come from another world and am, without their knowing it, protecting those who have service to perform. You may have been a disciple of Syed Imdadullah, but you are not mature enough to know what we are doing for the sake of God. When I looked up, he was gone, and all I could hear was a rushing sound in the air. After coming back from Khotan, I saw the same man. He was lying on a straw mattress in a rest house near Peshawar. I said to myself, If I was too raw the last time, this time I'll be mature. I took hold of his robe, which was a very common one, though under it I thought I saw something glow green. You may be hidder, I said to him, but I have to know how an apparently ordinary man like you performs these wonders, and why. Explain your craft to me, so that I can practice it too. He laughed. <laughs> You're impetuous, my friend. The last time you were too headstrong, and now you're still too headstrong. Go on, tell everyone you meet that you've seen Hida Elias. They'll put you in the madhouse, and the more you protest your right, the more heavily they'll chain you. Then he took out a small stone. I stared at it, and found myself paralysed, turned to stone until he had picked up his saddlebags and walked away. When I tell this story, people either laugh or, thinking me a storyteller, Give me presents. Hassan of Basra When he was asked, What is Islam and who are the Muslims? He answered, Islam is in the books, and Muslims are in the tomb. What man really knows? Men suppose, fancifully, that they know truth and divine perception. In fact, they know nothing. Juzjani Sufian Thaori A man in a dream met a Sufi who had been rewarded for his good actions. I was even given a reward for removing a fruit peel from the road when someone might have slipped upon it, said the Sufi. Sufian Thaori, when this was reported to him, said, how fortunate he was not to have been punished for each occasion upon which he gave charity and felt personal pleasure at it. Ghazali Sin 
Sin against God is one thing, but sinning against man is worse. Sufian Thaori Man must be in the correct state. Uwais el Khani said to some visitors, Do you seek God? If so, why have you come to me? The visitors only thought that they sought God. Their presence and emanations gave them away. If you do not, continued Uwais, what truck have you with me? Because they were intellectuals and emotionalists, they could not understand him. Bayazid Bistami A fire-worshipping Magian was asked why he did not become a Muslim. He answered, If you mean that I should be as good a man as Bayazid, I lack the courage. If, however, you mean that I should be as bad a man as you, I would detest it. Class The lower classes of society are those who fatten themselves in life in the name of religion. Ibn al-Mubarak Names You call me a Christian to make me angry and to make yourself feel happy. Others call themselves Christians to make themselves feel other emotions. Very well. If we are dealing in exciting words, I will call you a devil worshipper. That should give you an agitation which will please you for some time. Zabadast Khan Bayezid Bistami A devoutly religious man, who was a disciple of Bayezid, said to him one day, I'm surprised that anyone who accepts God should not attend the mosque for worship. Bayezid answered, I, on the other hand, am surprised that anyone who knows God can worship him and not lose his senses, rendering his ritual prayer invalid. Service I will not serve God like a labourer in expectation of my wages. Rabia el Adawiya. To be a believer. You probably seem to yourself to be a believer, even if you are a believer in disbelief. But you cannot really believe in anything until you are aware of the process by which you arrived at your position. Before you do this, you must be ready to postulate that all your beliefs may be wrong, that what you think to be belief may only be a variety of prejudice caused by your surroundings including the bequest of your ancestors for whom you may have a sentiment. True belief belongs to the realm of real knowledge. Until you have knowledge, belief is mere coalesced opinions, however it may seem to you. Coalesced opinions serve for ordinary living. Real belief enables higher studies to be made. Attributed to Ali The Blacksmith of Nishapur Abu Hafs, the blacksmith of Nishapur, showed signs of strange endowments through the power of his attention from the early days of his discipleship. He was accepted as a pupil by Sheikh Bawadi and returned to his smithy to continue his work. While his mind was concentrated, he pulled a piece of red-hot iron from the forge with his bare hand. Although he did not feel the heat, his assistant collapsed at this unprecedented sight. When he was Grand Sheikh of the Sufis of Khorasan, it was noted that he did not speak Arabic and used an interpreter in speaking to Arab visitors. Yet when he visited the great Sufis of Baghdad, he spoke the language so well that the purity of his speech was unsurpassed. When the Sheikhs of Baghdad asked him to tell them the meaning of generosity, he said, I will hear another define it first. The master Junaid then said, Generosity is not identifying generosity with yourself and not considering it. Abu Hafs commented, The sheikh has spoken well, but I feel that generosity means doing justice without requiring justice. 
Junaid said to the others, Stand, all of you, for Abu Hafs has transcended Adam and all his race. Abu Hafs used to say, I abandoned work and then went back to it. Then it abandoned me, and I never went back to it. Hujwiri, The Revelation of the Veiled Shibli and Junaid Abu Bakr, son of Dulaf, son of Jada el Shibli, and Abul Kazim el Junaid, peacock of the learned, are two of the early classical masters of the Sufis. They both lived and taught over a thousand years ago. The story of Shibli's discipleship under Junaid, given here, comes from the Revelation of the Veiled, one of the most important early books on the subject. Junaid himself was spiritualized by the influence of Ibrahim, son of Adam, Ben Adam in Lee Hunt's poem, who was, like Buddha, a prince who abdicated to follow the way and who died in the 8th century. Shibli, a proud courtier, went to Junaid seeking real knowledge. He said, I hear that you have the divine knowledge. Give it or sell it to me. Junaid said, I cannot sell it to you, because you do not possess its price. I cannot give it to you, because thus you would have it too cheap. You must immerse yourself in water, as I have, in order to obtain the pearl. What shall I do? asked Shibli. Go and become a seller of sulphur. When a year had passed, Junaid said to him, You are flourishing as a merchant. Now be a dervish doing nothing other than begging. Shibli spent a year begging in the streets of Baghdad without any success. He went back to Junaid. The master told him, To mankind you are now nothing. Let them be nothing to you. In the past you were a governor. Return now to that province and seek out every person whom you oppressed. Ask the forgiveness of each one. He went found them all except one, and received their pardon. On his return, Junaid said that he still felt in some way self-important. He was to spend another year in begging. The money which he gained in this way was brought each evening to the master, who gave it to the poor. Shibli himself got no food until the following morning. He was accepted as a disciple. When a year was over, Spent as a servant of the other students, he felt himself to be the most humble of creation. He used to illustrate the difference between the Sufis and the unregenerate by saying things incomprehensible to the populace at large. One day, because of his cryptic talk, he was mocked as a madman in public by detractors. He said, To your mind I am mad. To my mind you are all sane. So I pray to increase my madness and to increase your sanity. My madness is from the power of love. Your sanity is from the strength of unawareness. Ghulam Haida of Kashmir Hearing a discussion among his disciples about the importance of meticulous observance of the religious law as a means to illumination, Ghulam Haydar gave orders that, on any pretext, the following were to be collected and brought before him. One Jew, one Christian, one Zoroastrian, one Hindu priest, one Sikh, one Buddhist, one Farangi, Frank or Christian, one Shia, one Sunni, one pagan and several others. The last included traders, workmen, farmers, clerics and clerks, a baker and various women of all types. For three years his adherents worked to collect these people in one place at one time, not telling them that their presence was required by their master. In order to do this they spread rumours of treasure in Kashmir, became merchants sent to distant places for tutors and servants. At last all were assembled. When he was informed that they were there, Ghulam Haidar instructed that they were all to be invited to a meal at his hall of teaching, the Zawiya. 
When all had eaten, the peer, Ghulam Haydar, addressed the company, of whom a very large proportion were those strangers who did not adhere to his doctrine. Also present were all the disciples, who had been told to take no part in the proceedings except to watch. The peer spoke in several languages, explaining the need for man to dedicate himself to effort and to master the mysteries which were his birthright, regardless of his prejudices. Without exception, the strangers were desirous of following the peer, and their mutual enmity vanished. It is from this company that sprang the teachers known as the loaves of bread, those whose dough had been fashioned by the Kashmiri peer, regardless of their basic prejudices. After this meeting, Haydar said, Dough is dough, and one dough is not better than another. Eat no stones. A hunter, walking through some woods, came upon a notice. He read the words, Stone eating is forbidden. His curiosity was stimulated, and he followed a track which led past the sign until he came to a cave at the entrance to which a Sufi was sitting. The Sufi said to him, The answer to your question is that you have never seen a notice prohibiting the eating of stones, because there is no need for one. Not to eat stones may be called a common habit. Only when the human being is able similarly to avoid other habits, even more destructive than eating stones, will he be able to get beyond his present pitiful state. Why the dog could not drink Shibli was asked, Who guided you in the path? He said, A dog. One day I saw him, almost dead with thirst, standing by the water's edge. Every time he looked at his reflection in the water, he was frightened and withdrew because he thought it was another dog. Finally, such was his necessity. He cast away fear and leapt into the water, at which the other dog vanished. The dog found that the obstacle, which was himself, the barrier between him and what he sought melted away. In this same way my own obstacle vanished, when I knew that it was what I took to be my own self, and my way was first shown to me by the behaviour of a dog. Demonstration of Training a malicious man one day invited Osman al-Hiri to eat with him. When the sheikh arrived, the man drove him away, but when he had gone a few steps he called him back again. This happened more than thirty times, until the other man, overcome by the Sufi's patience and gentleness as he took to be, broke down and begged his forgiveness. You do not understand, said al-Hiri. What I did was no more than a trained dog would do. When you call him, he comes. When you shoo him, he goes away. This behaviour is no mark of a Sufi, and not difficult for anyone to do. What the Devil Said Once upon a time there was a dervish. As he was sitting in contemplation, he noticed that there was a sort of devil near him. The dervish said, Why are you sitting there, making no mischief? The demon raised his head wearily. Oh, since the theoreticians and would-be teachers of the path have appeared in such numbers, there is nothing left for me to do. The Four Sheikhs and the Caliph The Caliph Mansur decided to appoint one of four great Sufi sheikhs as Grand Judge of the Empire. They were called to the palace. Abu Hanifa, Sufian Thauri, Mizar, and Shurey, but on the way they made a plan. Abu Hanifa, one of the four great doctors of law, as he is now called, said, I shall escape from the position by an evasion. Mizar will pretend that he is insane, Sufian will flee, and I predict that Shurey will become judge. 
Sufian accordingly took to flight and exile to escape being executed for disobedience. The other three entered the presence of the caliph. First, Mansur said to Abu Hanifa, You shall be judge. Abu Hanifa replied, Commander of the faithful, I cannot. I am not an Arab. I am therefore not likely to be accepted by the Arabs. The caliph said, This has nothing to do with blood. We need learning, and you are the most esteemed sage of the time. Abu Hanifa insisted, If my words have been true, I cannot be judge, and if they were false, I do not deserve the position and am thus disqualified. Thus Abu Hanifa proved his point and was excused. Mizar, the second reluctant candidate, now approached the commander of the believers and taking his hand cried, Are you well, you and your little ones and your cattle? Take him away, shouted the caliph, for he is certainly mad. Only Sharay was left, and he claimed that he was ill, but Mansur made him undergo a course of remedies and made him judge. A Matter of Honour A wandering Sufi, found in the desert, was brought to the tent of a wild Bedouin chief. You are a scout for our enemies, and as such we shall kill you, said the chief. I am innocent, said the Sufi. Do you see this sword? asked the Sufi, drawing one. Before you can approach me, I shall kill one of your men here. When I have done so, you will have a legitimate right to avenge his death. By so doing, I shall save your honour, which is at this moment in grave danger of being sullied by the blood of a Sufi. Fudail the Highwayman and His Child Fudail, son of Ayad, was once a highwayman. After his conversion to the religious life, he felt that he was worshipping God in the right way and making amends for his crimes, for he had sought out all his victims and recompensed them. One day, however, he had a strange experience. He had taken his little son upon his knee and kissed him. Do you love me? asked the child. Yes, I do, said Fidel. But do you not also love God, as you have often told me? Yes, I believe that I do, said his father. But how can you, with one heart, love two? It was from this moment that Fidel realized that what he had taken for love was in fact sentimentality, and that he must find a higher form of love. This incident was the origin of his saying, That which is generally considered to be the highest or noblest attainment of humankind is in reality the lowest of the high ranges possible to humankind. Problems of Generosity A student, going to pay his respects to a Sufi, asked him, out of curiosity, why are those thirty magnificent Herat mules standing in your courtyard? The sage immediately said, They are there for you. The student was delighted when he heard that they were being given to him, although he said, I should pay you some price, surely. The price, said the master, may be more than you can pay by yourself, but the condition is that you tell nobody that I gave the mules to you. I am not here to be known as good among men because of such actions. People in general think that something is good because of an action whose consequences and origin they cannot grasp. Nothing seems smaller than your price, said the student. He led the mules away in rapture, saying to himself, My teacher has indeed benefited me. This is the outer manifestation of an interior blessing. Soon evening fell, and within a few moments the student fell into the hands of the night patrol. Its members said to one another, Let us accuse this man of such and such a crime which we cannot in any case solve. We can suggest that he bought the mules with the profit of the theft, unless he can account for their possession otherwise. He is probably guilty of something, being ill-nurtured and poorly dressed. Some of us have seen him before, 
and believe in any case that he has associates of doubtful character. Taken before the summary court, the student at first refused to answer any questions about the origin of the mules. The examining magistrate ordered that he be put to the bastinado. In the meantime, another body of disciples were attending the sage, who sent them, in relays, to follow the fortunes of the first man. They reported, from time to time, He refuses to talk, and He is weakening, they are torturing him. At length the Sufi stood up and made haste to the court. On his testimony that he had given the man the mules, the prisoner was released. Then he addressed the court, his disciples and the public, who were perplexed at the event, thus. The repute of generosity has three evils. It can corrode the man who has this repute. It can harm the man who admires this generosity if he imitates it ignorantly. It can erode whoever receives generosity if he knows the giver. There should be no sense of obligation. That is why it is incumbent upon the Sufi to exercise generosity with complete secrecy. The highest form of generosity known to the ordinary man is equal to the lowest level of real generosity. It was originally instituted as a way of introducing man to liberality. It has become an idol and a curse. The Fortune of Man El Mahdi Abbasi announced that it was verifiable that whether people tried to help a man or not, something in him could frustrate this aim. Certain people having objected to this theory, he promised a demonstration. When everyone had forgotten the incident, El Mahdi ordered one man to lay a sack of gold in the middle of a bridge. Another man was asked to bring some unfortunate debtor to one end of the bridge and tell him to cross it. Abbasi and his witnesses stood at the other side of the bridge. When the man got to the other side, Abbasi asked him, What did you see in the middle of the bridge? Nothing, said the man. How was that? As soon as I started to cross the bridge, the thought occurred to me that it might be amusing to cross it with my eyes shut and I did so. The Flower and the Stone When the great teacher and martyr Mansul al halaj was exposed to the crowd, convicted of apostasy and heresy, he showed no evidence of pain when his hands were publicly chopped off. When the crowd threw stones which inflicted great wounds, he made no sign. One of his friends, a Sufi teacher, approached and struck him with a flower. Mansur screamed as if in torture. He did this in order to show that he could not be hurt by anything done by those who thought that they were doing right. But the merest touch from someone who knew, like him, that he was unjustly accused and condemned was more hurtful to him than any torture. Mansur and his Sufi companions, helpless though they were in the face of such tyranny, are remembered for that lesson, while their torturers are almost forgotten. As he was dying, Mansur said, The people of this world try to do good. I recommend you to seek something of which the smallest part is worth more than all goodness, the knowledge of what is true, true science. Hanbal and the Conditioned Mind Ahmad ibn Hanbal was the founder of one of the four great schools of law and companion of many of the early Sufi masters. When he was of advanced years and very frail, a heretical party in Baghdad seized power and tried to get a ruling out of him as to the correctness of their views. Imam Hanbal refused, so he was given a thousand lashes and put to the torture. Before he died, as he did quite soon from this treatment, he was asked what he thought of his murderers. He said, I can only say that they thrashed me because they believed they were right and I was in the wrong. 
How can I claim justice against those who believe that they are right? Man believes what he thinks is true. Teaching, as was his custom, during the ordinary business of life, Sheikh Abu Tahir Harami rode his donkey one day into a marketplace, a disciple following behind. At the sight of him, a man called out, Look, here comes the ancient unbeliever! Harami's pupil, his wrath aroused, shouted at the defamer. Before long, there was a fierce altercation in progress. The Sufi calmed his disciple, saying, If you will only cease this tumult, I will show you how you can escape this kind of trouble. They went together to the old man's house. The sheikh told his follower to bring him a box of letters. Look at these. They are all letters addressed to me, but they are couched in different terms. Here someone calls me Sheikh of Islam, their sublime teacher. Another says I am the wise one of the twin sanctuaries, and there are others. Observe how each styles me in accordance with what he considers me to be, but I am none of these things. Each man calls another just what he thinks him to be. This is what the unfortunate one in the marketplace has just done, and yet you take exception to it. Why do you do so, since it is the general rule of life? Which way round is right? A certain wise man was widely reputed to have become irrational in his presentation of facts and arguments. It was decided to test him, so that the authorities of his country could pronounce as to whether he was a danger to public order or not. On the day of the test, he paraded past the courtroom mounted on a donkey, facing the donkey's rear. When the time came for him to speak for himself, he said to the judges, When you saw me just now, which way was I facing? The judges said, Facing the wrong way. You illustrate my point, he answered, for I was facing the right way from one point of view. It was the donkey which was facing the wrong way. The Master it is related by a Sufi master that when he was a youth, he wanted to attach himself to a teaching master. He sought the sage and asked to become his disciple. The teacher said, You are not yet ready. Since the young man was insistent, the sage said, Very well, I will teach you something. I am going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. Come with me. The disciple was overjoyed. Since we are travelling companions, said the teacher, one must lead and the other obey. Choose your role. I will follow, you lead, said the disciple. If you know how to follow, said the master. The journey started. While they were resting one night in the desert of the Hejaz, it started to rain. The master got up and held a covering over the disciple, protecting him. But this is what I should be doing for you, said the disciple. I command you to allow me to protect you thus, said the sage. When it was day, the young man said, Now it is a new day. Let me be the leader and you follow me. The master agreed. I shall now collect brushwood to make a fire, said the youth. You may do no such thing. I shall collect it, said the sage. I command you to sit there while I collect the brushwood, said the young man. You may do no such thing, said the teacher, for it is not in accordance with the requirements of discipleship for the follower to allow himself to be served by the leader. And so on every occasion the master showed the student what discipleship really meant by demonstration. They parted at the gate of the holy city. Seeing the sage later, the young man could not meet his eyes. That which you have learnt, said the older man, is something of the nature of discipleship. The disciple must know how to obey, not merely that he must obey. 
the question of whether to become a disciple or not, only comes after the person knows what discipleship really is. People spend their time wondering whether they should be disciples or otherwise. Since their assumption that they could be a disciple if they wished it is incorrect, they are living in a false world, an intellectualist world. Such people have not learned the first lesson. Hilali of Samarkand Hilali, accompanied by five of his disciples, went on a long journey through Central Asia. From time to time Hilali made his companions act in various ways. These are some of their adventures. When they reached Bach and a deputation of the great people from the city came out to meet the master, Hilali said to Yusuf Lang, Be thou the master. Yusuf was received and honoured. Reports spread of the miracles which he had accomplished merely by staying under the same roof as certain sick people. This is what people think Dervishhood is, and what we know it is not, said Hilali. In Serkab, the companions entered the town all dressed the same, none walking in front of another. Which is the great master? asked the chief of the town. I am he said Hilali. Immediately the people fell back, exclaiming, We knew it by the light in his eyes! Take a lesson from this, said Hilali to his companions. When the company entered Kandahar, they were given a feast by the chief Sada, all sitting in a circle. Hilali had given orders that he was to be treated as the least of the disciples, and that Jafar Akunzada was to be treated as the master. But the chief Sada said, Verily, this least of the companions shines with the inner light, and whatever you may say of him, I regard him as the Kutub, the magnetic centre of the age. All saluted Hilali, who was forced to recognise that the Sada, although a ruler, had also the capacity to perceive what other men do not perceive. The Curse of the Bedouin one day, in the oasis of Kufa, a rough Bedouin strode up to Hassan, grandson of Muhammad, and started to revile him, his father and his mother. Hassan said, Bedouin, are you in need? What is your trouble? But the Bedouin, taking no notice at all, continued to shout and curse. Hassan had some money brought and given to the man, and spoke to him again. Bedouin, forgiveness! This is all that there is in this house, but I say that if we had anything else, I would have given it to you without any reservation. When he heard these words, the Bedouin was overcome, and cried out, I bear witness that you are truly the grandson of the messenger, for I had come here in order to test whether your lineage and your nature were in accord one with the other. Why the Dervish was at court. One of the dicta of Hadrad ibn al Kafif of Shiraz was A Sufi should not visit a ruler or come out in welcome if he is visited by him. It was therefore a matter of surprise to two would be Sufis who arrived at his home when they were told that he was at the court of the king. They changed their minds about his great sanctity and decided to walk in the city instead of paying their respects to him. Visiting a shop, they became innocently involved in an altercation, were accused of theft, and hauled before the king for judgment. Convinced by the shopkeeper that the two were guilty, the monarch ordered them to be killed on the spot as an example. Ibn el Kafif, still at court, interceded, and their lives were spared. It may have been natural for you to think that I should not be at court, said the sage to the pair but learn at least that a Sufi does unexpected things, for invisible but nevertheless sufficient reasons. The Compulsion to Teach Bishir, son of Harith, was asked why he did not teach. I have stopped teaching because I find that I have a desire to teach. If this compulsion passes, 
I shall teach of my own free will. Time for learning. The sage of Ascalon would only speak to his disciples rarely. When he did, they were overcome by his ideas. May we have lectures at times when we can conveniently attend, they asked, because when you speak, some of us have family duties and cannot always be there. You will have to find someone else to do that, he said, because whereas I only teach when I do not feel the urge to teach, there do exist some who can teach in accordance with who is present at a fixed time. It is they who feel the urge to teach, and consequently only have the need to adapt what they say to the audience. If I ask and they refuse. A dervish was asked, Why do you not ask something from people so that you may have food? He said, If I ask them and they refuse me, there is a danger that they will suffer for it. The prophet is reported to have said that if a sincere, needy man asks, those who refuse to give him something will languish. How you should think of me. A disciple came to Maruf Khaki and said, I've been talking to people about you. Jews claim that you are a Jew. Christians revere you as one of their own saints. Muslims insist that you are the greatest of all Muslims. Maruf answered, This is what humanity says in Baghdad. When I was in Jerusalem, Jews said that I was a Christian, Muslims that I was a Jew, and Christians that I was a Muslim. What must we think of you then? said the man. Some do not understand me, and they revere me. Others do not either, so they revile me. That is what I have come to say. You should think of me as one who has said this. Saint Worship A Sufi sheikh was asked by a visitor, Is there any value in saint worship? He at once said, It is illogical, and it is forbidden by Islam. The inquirer went away, satisfied. A disciple who had been present said, But your answer did not cover the implications of the question. The sheikh told him, The questioner was at the stage of shariat, or conventionalist religion. The way in which he put the question showed that there was a certain reassurance which he wanted, and he sought it from me, of whom he had heard as a reliable source of opinion. There is, however, another kind of relationship with saints, one other than worship. Visiting their tombs has a virtue, but this virtue is operative only for those who can perceive it. This man was not one of them, so this other aspect of the question was void in his case. A man last month asked for verification of the fact that cures wrought by shrine meditation were entirely due to the aspiration, not the saint. I agreed with him. He had no capacity for more complex ideas, but in other words, this may be partly true on some occasions, wholly on others, and so on. It is characteristic of the blind that they can only see certain questions. Saints were men. Visiting a shrine to some is bound to be saint worship. Saint worship is ignorant. Therefore there can be no advantage in saint worship. One in a thousand, perhaps, who visits a shrine will know inwardly why he is there and what is the nature of the virtue which he may derive from it. It is but natural that all pilgrims will imagine that they are devout, and hence that they are all doing or experiencing exactly the same thing. Of course they are not. Have you ever tried to show a misguided man that his vision is narrow? He may listen to you in appearance, but for the sake of his own self-esteem he will reject what you mean, if not what you say. Muhammad Shah, Murshid of Turkestan Muhammad Shah, Murshid, or guide of Turkestan, 
was a 19th century teacher who took his examples from the juice, or real inner content, of ordinary actions in life. This is a typical account of his methods. Muhammad Shah took a group of his halka, circle, to see certain sights. One was a tall minaret set beside a river. This was built by people who persevere, he said. Then he took them to see a party of Brahmin pilgrims walking to the holy Jumna River. These are people who persevere, he said. On another day he took his people to watch a caravan which had come through the desert wastes of China. These are people who persevere, he said. Finally he bade them go to Tibet to watch pilgrims measuring their length along the ground, making a holy journey. Those were people who persevere, he told them when they returned. After some months, he made them watch magistrates trying cases, to observe the efforts of the magistrate, the energy of the witnesses, the aspirations of the plaintiffs, the efforts of the accused. In all of these things you see men and women persevering, he said. Men everywhere persevere. The yield of this perseverance is what is of account. This they can harvest and use. If, on the other hand, during the perseverance they become beguiled by the thing for which they persevere, they cannot make use of the training of the struggle of perseverance. All that happens to them is that they become trained in persevering after something. Why the Dervish Hides Himself Rumi's son asked him, How and why is the dervish hidden? Is this done by superficial disguise? Is there something within himself which he conceals? The master said, it might be done in any way. Some write love poems, and people think that they mean ordinary love. The dervish may hide his true position in the way by adopting a calling. There are writers, and some, like Baba Farid, are traders. Still others follow various different outer activities. This may be done for the sake of defence against the shallow. Some purposely act in a manner which society might disapprove. The Prophet has therefore said, God has hidden the men of greatest knowledge. A device may be adopted by the followers of the way to gain peace, when they might otherwise be hindered. The Master then recited, Ever knowing, as they hide, they seek, appearing other than they are to the ordinary man. In inward light they roam, making miracles come to pass. Yet they are really known to none. Munakib el Arifin. Prayers for the Dead. Sufian Thauri heard that a funeral was to take place, and he followed the coffin. He prayed at the graveside. After the service, people began to say what a good man the deceased had been. I should not have prayed for the man, said Sufian, for when you hear people speak well of a man, it is generally because he is a hypocrite, whether he knew it or not. If a man is not a hypocrite, there are always many who do not speak well of him. Thauri on Contemplation the great Shibli went to visit the illustrious Thauri. The master was sitting so still that not a hair of him moved in any way. Shibli asked, Where did you learn such stillness? Thauri replied, From a cat. He was watching a mouse hole with even greater concentration than you have seen in me. Strange Agitation Sal Abdullah once went into a state of violent agitation with physical manifestations during a religious meeting. Ibn Salim said, What is this state? Sal said, This was not, as you imagine, power entering me. It was, on the contrary, due to my own weakness. Others present remarked, 
If that was weakness, what is power? Power, said Sarl, is when something like this enters, and the mind and body manifest nothing at all. The Ass Saul was on a journey with Ibrahim, son of Adam, and fell ill. He relates that Ibrahim sold all that he owned to spend on the sick man. One day Saul asked for some delicacy, and Ibrahim sold his donkey and bought it for him. When he was convalescing, Saul asked Ibrahim, Where is the donkey for me to ride upon? I am he, said Ibrahim, ride on my shoulders and he carried Saul on his back for the rest of the journey. Ibn Salim A large number of people assembled in front of Ibn Salim's house. He was asked to speak to them in the words, Your disciples are here. He answered, These are not my disciples, but the disciples of my audience. My disciples are the few. Responsibility of the Teacher Haji Bektash appointed Nuruddin Chakmak as his Khalifa, or deputy, in the farthest north. At that time, Sheikh Chakmak already had many disciples, for he was a dervish who had attracted, through his dedication and readings of the ancient masters, several circles of pupils. Moreover, he had been in intimate contact with more than one of the teachers. The Haji gave him teachings which, on the surface, were strongly at variance with the traditional customs and thoughts to which the disciples were accustomed. Shakmak decided to evade his responsibility by handing over his flock to the Haji. But Haji Bektash refused and told Shakmak, Only by acting as a channel from me to your people will you yourself become transformed. Shakmak feared that this new teaching would undermine his authority. If you teach only through authority, you are not teaching at all, said Haji Bektash. Certain of Shakmak's disciples came to complain to Haji Bektash that their master was behaving in an eccentric manner. We are no longer able to have the comfort of the customary observances, they said. This is exactly what I want to happen, said the Haji. Other disciples feared that the Haji had influenced Shakmak and that he would influence them similarly. This was reported to the Haji. He said, They see something good happening to Shakmak, but they think it is bad. This is a fever which has to burn itself out. Four years passed before, entirely through the Haji's example, Shakmak's disciples realized that Bektash had other things to do than capture lame horses. Bektash said, It was your own self-esteem about yourselves which made you imagine that you were something which anyone would bother himself to enslave. The Jewel A young man came to Danun and said that the Sufis were wrong and many other things besides. The Egyptian removed a ring from his finger and handed it to him. Take this to the market stallholders over there and see whether you can get a gold piece for it, he said. Nobody among the market people offered more than a single silver piece for the ring. The young man brought it back. Now, said Dunun, take this ring to a real jeweller and see what he will pay. The jeweller offered a thousand gold coins for the gem. The youth was amazed. Now, said Dunun, your knowledge of the Sufis is as great as the knowledge of the stallholders is of jewellery. If you wish to value gems, become a jeweller. Whoever listens to something which is obscene is an accomplice of whoever speaks obscenely. El Shafai Bayezid Bistami Bayezid encountered a dog and started to pull his robe away from it so that it should not defile him. The dog, in a human voice, said, 
If I had been dry, there would have been no purpose in avoiding me. If I had been wet, you could have washed your robe, but the hate which you have towards me can never be cleansed. Bayezid said, O oh, enlightened dog, come and stay with me for a while. The dog answered, That is impossible, because the world uses me as an epithet, and you are regarded by the world as a paragon. Bayezid exclaimed, Alas, am I not fit to live with one whom the whole world regards as inferior? How can I therefore approach the truth, which all regard as the highest of all? Upon being asked, What is being a Sufi? Bayezid said, Giving up comforts and trying to carry out efforts, that is the practice of the Sufi. The Idol Someone told Uwais Salkani that a certain dervish sat on a tomb, dressed in a shroud and weeping. Kani said, Tell him that the method has become an idol. He must transcend the practice, for it is an obstacle. Money Uwais Salkani was offered some money. He said, I do not need it, as I already have a coin. The other said, How long will that last you? It is nothing. Uwais answered, Guarantee me that I shall live longer than this sum will suffice me, and I will accept your gift. Do not regret the past and do not worry about the future. Danun A learned man who has many friends may be a fraud, because if he were to tell them the truth, they would no longer be his friends. Sufian Thaori Junaid used to speak to an audience of about ten people. He always stopped talking when the number rose very much above this, and his audiences were never composed of more than twenty people. When we speak, we are careful not to make a mistake in grammar. When, however, we act, we make mistakes and do not reach what should be our aim. Ibrahim ibn Adam The Delightful Village They say, this village is delightful. But more delightful still is the heart of the man who can say, I am not delighted by delightful villages. Yahya Razi The Essentials, Conduct and Occasion Sufism is conduct. To each time it's conduct. To each station it's conduct. To each state it's conduct. Whoever follows the behaviour of each occasion arrives at the aim of man. Whoever does not observe the rules of conduct is far from the mentality of nearness. Abu Hafs The Complete Man The camel driver has his plans, and the camel has his own plans. The organised mind can think well. The complete man's mind can exist well. Razul Shah The candle is not there to illuminate itself. Nawab Janvishkan Khan it is a big claim to call oneself a Sufi. Remember, anyway, that I do not call myself one. Hadrat Abul Hassan Kirkani When you have not studied the celestial science, while you have not put foot inside a tavern, since you do not know your own profit and loss, how will you attain the friends? On. On, on, on. Baba Tahir Uriyan Travel, with and without a vehicle. If you cast yourself into the sea without any guidance, this is full of danger, because man mistakes things which arise within himself for things arising from elsewhere. 
If, on the other hand, you travel on the sea in a ship, this is perilous, because there is the danger of attachment to the vehicle. In the one case, the end is not known, and there is no guidance. In the other case, the means becomes an end, and there is no arriving. Nifari A dervish master said, When you hear a man say, It has been said, know that he is really saying, Listen to what I am saying. Bishir el Hafi. Observe that the things which are considered to be right today are those which were considered to be impossible yesterday. The things which are thought wrong today are those which will be esteemed right tomorrow. Hudhaifa. Mistakes are often delightful to the minds of those who follow them. Ibn Abbas. When asked why he did not correct the prayer of another man, Maruf Khaki said, A dervish is free to instruct only after he has completed his own service. Assuredly, some forms of what is called knowledge are in reality ignorance, and some forms of what is thought to be eloquence are in reality incoherence. The Prophet Ali indicated his heart and said, I have here a sufficiency of knowledge, but I cannot find anyone to whom to entrust it. There are plenty of people, but they too quickly become uncertain or sceptical. How I yearn for the really learned. If I am mistaken, it does not matter much to your future. But if I am right, it is all important to your future. The Caliph Ali Those who worship the externals. If the Muslim knew what an idol was, he would know that there is religion in idolatry. If the idolater knew what religion was, he would know where he had gone astray. He sees in the idol nothing but the obvious creature. This is why he is, in Islamic law, a heathen. Shabistari. Worship Mankind passes through three stages. First, he worships anything, man, woman, money, children, earth and stones. Then when he has progressed a little further, he worships God. Finally, he does not say, I worship God, nor, I do not worship God. He has passed from the first two stages into the last. Rumi. Asceticism. First, there is knowledge. Then there is asceticism. Then there is the knowledge that comes after that asceticism. The ultimate knower is worth a hundred thousand ascetics. Rumi. The Beloved. One went to the door of the Beloved and knocked. A voice asked, Who is there? He answered, It is I. The voice said, There is no room here for me and thee. The door remained shut. After a year of solitude and deprivation, this man returned to the door of the Beloved. He knocked. A voice from within asked, Who is there? The man said, It is thou. The door was opened for him. Rumi Emptiness Everyone in the ordinary world is asleep. Their religion, the religion of the familiar world, is emptiness not religion at all. Sane Hadika Hunger People sated with themselves are so because of their hunger for something else, 
they are therefore hungry. Those who turn back from wrongdoing, they are the ones who are at prayer, not those who merely seem to bend in prayer. Prayer is an activity. Sene Hadika. The Being of God No human mind can attain an understanding of the form of being which is called God. Sene Hadika. Praying for oneself. Sa'ad, son of Waqas, was a companion of the Prophet. In his last years he became blind and settled in Mecca, where he was always surrounded by people seeking his blessing. He did not bless everyone, but those whom he did always found their way smooth for them. Abdallah ibn Sa'ad reports, I went to see him, and he was good to me and gave me his blessing. As I was only a curious child, I asked him, Your prayers for others always seem to be answered. Why then do you not pray for your blindness to be removed? The ancient replied, Submission to the will of God is far better than the personal pleasure of being able to see. Sentimentality Once, when Bishir was a Sufi disciple still dependent entirely upon the comfort of men, he was on the island of Abadan. There he came across a most unfortunate man. He was suffering from leprosy, was blind, and lay on the ground with nobody near him. Bishir went to him and raised his head on his knees, speaking some words of reassurance and humanity, feeling sorrow and compassion. The leper then spoke out, saying, What stranger comes here to stand between me and my Lord? With or without my body I have my love for him. Bishir recounts that this lesson had remained with him throughout his days. Mashkul says, this story can only be understood by those who realized how the leper was preventing Bishir from indulging his own sentimentality in ruining himself through being turned into what humanity calls a good man. Good is what you do voluntarily and not in furtherance of an appetite for indulgence taught by others in the name of humanity. Bishir ibn al-Harith The Patched Robe There was a Jew of Damascus who was reading a holy book one day when he came across the name of the prophet written in it. Not liking this, he removed the name, but the next day he found it there again. Again he took out the name, but on the third day it had appeared again. He thought, perhaps this is a sign that a true emissary has come. I will journey southwards to Medina. And he forthwith started out, not tarrying until he reached the city of the prophet. When he arrived there, knowing nobody, he was near the mosque of the prophet when the companion Anas arrived. He said to Anas, Friend, take me to the prophet. Anas led him into the mosque, which was full of people in anguish. Abu Bakr, the successor, was sitting there at the head of the assembly. The old man went up to him, thinking he must be Muhammad, and said, O chosen envoy of God, a strayed old man has come to offer you peace. Hearing the title of the prophet used, everyone present burst into a flood of tears. The stranger was uncertain as to what to do. He said, I am a foreigner and a Jew and I am unaware of the rights of the faith of submission to the will of Allah. Have I said something untoward? Should I have remained silent? Or is this a ritual observance? Why do you cry? If it is a ceremony, I have never heard of it. Omar, the companion, said to him, We do not weep because of anything which you have done, but you must hear, unfortunate one, 
that it is but a week since the prophet left the earth. When we heard his name, grief took possession of our hearts anew. As soon as he heard this, the ancient tore his clothes in anguish. When he had recovered a little, he said, Do me one favour. Let me have at least a robe of the prophet. If I cannot see him, at least let me have this. Omar answered, Only the Lady Zora could give us one of his robes. Ali said, But she will not allow anyone to go near her. But they went to her door and knocked and explained what they wanted. The Lady Zora answered, Verily, the Prophet spoke truly when he said, shortly before he died, A wayfarer who has love towards me and who is a good man will come to the house. He will not see me. Give him, therefore, this patchwork robe as if from me, and for me treat him gently, offering salutations. The Jew put the robe on himself, and, professing Islam, asked to be taken to the Prophet's grave. It was at this tomb that he breathed his last. Atar, Ilahi Nama Prayer of Sadi Do to me what is worthy of thee, and not what is worthy of me. Sadi Gulistan Seeing Halls and theological colleges and learned lectures, circles and cloisters, what use are they when there is no knowledge and there is no eye that sees? Hafiz The Aspect of the Dervish The form of the objective sought by kings in prayer is the appearance of the mirror of the aspect of the dervish. Hafiz <laughs>